Welcome to the UK Investor Magazine podcast, the latest on shares, markets and investments, now available on your Amazon Alexa. Hello and welcome to the UK Investor Magazine podcast, now also available on the UK Investor Magazine mobile app. For today's podcast, we're going to be lifting the lid on the investment trust space. We're going to be looking at where there could be some opportunities. We're going to be focusing on narrowing discounts, as well as some of the most interesting areas for investments where we have seen some flows. And to do that, we're very kindly joined today by Head of Investment Trust Research at Winterflood, Emma Bird. Emma, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. So, Emma, before we get into it, please, would you be able to give listeners a brief introduction, first of all, to yourself, as well as your role at Winterflood, please? Uh, Yes, of course. So I'm Emma Bird. I'm Head of Investment Trust Research at Winterflood. Uh, I've been in the research team there for over nine years now. Um, So what we do as the research team at Winterflood is we produce uh, sell-side coverage of the investment trust sector. So we aim to cover the entire universe of uh, London-listed investment trusts, uh, excluding VCTs, and provide research reports Um, on individual trusts as well as uh, subsectors and the sector as a whole for our uh, professional um, investor client base. Um, And something that your listeners may also be interested in is we have actually recently launched a new product that is suitable for retail investors called Fund Insight. Um, So readers can access that um, via www.windflood.com forward slash Fund Insight. And we will actually include a link to that in the notes of this podcast if anybody would like to check that out. So we're going to start with quite a broad point, if we may, Erin. And it has been something that's been quite a theme in uh, investment trusts over the last few years. We did see some pretty significant discounts on uh, investment trusts across the universe, but we, we've seen some narrowing. So when you're looking at that narrowing, particularly this year, What are the main factors that you see behind that? And is it something that you see that is set to continue from here? Yes. So I guess to give a a bit of background, um, we've seen discounts widen considerably across the investment trust sector from the beginning of 2022, when the sector average discount was only around 2% um, to a nadir of nearly 20% in late October 2023. Um, so just over a year ago, when it actually reached uh, levels not seen since the global financial crisis. Um, and I think much of this uh, discount widening over um, 2022 and 2023 can be attributed to the rising inflation and rising interest rate expectation environment. Um, as investors uh, anticipated some issues for a number of the underlying asset classes in the investment trust, um, but also as investors were kind of generally moving away from equities in general and reinvesting into um, gilts and other bonds that were suddenly looking more attractive in this new environment. Um, but as you note, um, in the last year or so, um, since that low in October 2023, we have seen some recovery, some discount tightening, um, as we appeared to be reaching peak interest rates as the macroeconomic outlook became more certain. I and mean, I think also as investors look to start taking advantage of um, what seemed to be anomalous and attractive discount levels. Um, but um, we haven't seen too much sustained uh, discount tightening really in the last few months. We actually saw some widening again in the weeks following the budget where we saw gilt yields rising again and kind of saw that correlation continue between discounts and yields. Um, and the sector average discount uh, now stands at around 15%. Um, we do keep uh, looking for catalysts for a re-rating. Um, those catalysts uh, seem to keep coming and going. We thought potentially um, the new government and some uh, political stability in the UK could be a catalyst, um, but we haven't really seen that. We thought maybe more certainty in the US election um, could have could have been the trigger or maybe the first interest rate cut. Um, we haven't really seen too much um, discount tightening and there's no real clear catalyst for further tightening. But what I would say is that discounts at this level, um, there probably is some downside protection there um, from the level of corporate activity we've seen. 
Um, so most notably, they have a significant pickup in share buyback. So boards buying back um, shares in trust to help support the share price, um, as well as it being a, um, an attractive capital allocation decision from them. Um, and also a wide range of mergers between investment trusts or takeovers from private equity um, or boards introducing um, just managed wind downs um, if they think that the, the um uh, the proposition isn't attractive anymore on an ongoing basis and the discount isn't going to narrow naturally and they've just been introducing wind downs um so maybe not the most positive outlook but i think um, there is some downside protection from those things thank you so you said at the beginning emma that you do sector focused research and, and that's what i would like to to look at now is, is the investment trust space on a on a sector basis so from where you're sitting, when you're looking at the space, are there any sectors that are standing out as being particularly uh, attractive on an income basis? And also, are there any sectors still that trade at particularly wide discounts to NAV that maybe are falling behind uh, the rest of the space that could catch up and, and offer that uh, possibility of capital appreciation if it was to snap back in line with the rest of the, the investment trust universe? Um, yes, I think there are a number of um, attractive opportunities out there. Um, t- to name a few, I think the UK equity income sector um, has some interesting opportunities. The UK market as a whole um, has been widely acknowledged to be undervalued relative to other markets for a number of years, um, despite um, you know, decent underlying uh, performance and earnings growth at the company level. Um, so the UK equity income sector at the moment is trading on an average discount um, of over 8%, um, even though they generally invest in a portfolio of liquid equities um, and offering a, an average yield of 4.8%, um, with some obviously offering even higher than that. Um, and something I'd highlight about the um, equity income sectors it, it, for investment trusts in general, not just the UK, um, a, a lot of them do um, commit uh, to trying to deliver annual um, consecutive annual dividend growth. So even though the absolute yield may not look as attractive relative to gilts at the moment, um, they do offer the potential for um, consistent um, and long-term dividend growth and income growth, which isn't something that you can get from gilts. So I think um, that's an, an interesting area to look at um, from a, a yield perspective. Um, on a yield and discount point of view, um, infrastructure and renewable energy infrastructure are still um, trading on considerable discounts, kind of double digit discounts. Um, they saw um, they were kind of one of the hardest hit um, during the 2022 sell off in the rising interest rate environment. Um, but I think there are some interesting opportunities there given the, the discount levels. Um, and I think as um, interest rates do fall. I think we have reached, um, I think it's consensus that we have reached peak rates um, as that uh, falling interest rate environment plays out and um, some of these could look more attractive. Um, and then on another uh, discount opportunity perspective, uh, private equity, again, is still on double digit discounts, but we are seeing kind of underlying fundamentals improving there in the more supportive macroeconomic environment we've seen a number of funds um complete exits so sell underlying uh private businesses at uplifts to their carrying value so that provides some more confidence in the uh navs and valuations and we've also seen a lot of boards commit to buyback programs there and um, which we expect to continue so that again and um, provides some support to the current levels um but that i would also um just add that within all of these sectors um there are kind of winners and losers, so uh, your listeners will need to assess um, individual opportunities with it within these to make sure that um, you're getting the best ones. Of course, of course. So I just want to pick up on a point that you, you made there, the particularly wide discount still on, on infrastructure, renewable infrastructure and, and private equity. Do you feel that that is a consequence of the, the macro environment uh, you know, still being a little bit soft, or do you think it's more about some concerns about how these assets are actually valued uh, which are causing this discount or is it a combination of that those two and maybe some other factors there 
Uh, yes, I think it. I think it is a combination of factors. Um, on the infrastructure side, um, a lot of these um, trusts were launched um, in a essentially a, a zero interest rate environment. Um, a, a lot of their appeal was their um, high yields, um, w- which investors couldn't get from bonds or savings in the bank, um, and a lot of them traded it at premiums because of this demand. Um, up until 2022 so we have definitely seen a, the discount widening um being triggered by the macroeconomic environment and the change in interest rate environment um but then we have seen some individual um um issues kind of issues at individual investment trusts um kind of concerns around governance um or um, the quality of the underlying assets, which has um, has spilled over into a lack of confidence in the sector as a whole. Um, And and yes, as you mentioned, there have been ongoing concerns around um, how accurate the the valuations are. So if people um, don't truly believe in what the NAV is, then obviously they're um, applying a discount to that in in the share price. and similarly with private equity, um, I think there were some concerns that the valuations weren't being written down to reflect the new uh, macro environment. Um, but as, as I noted, they, we are now seeing some a number of exits at uplift, so that should be providing some more confidence um, in, in the NAVs there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly an interesting point. Any divestment, you know, really does give it a market value, give any asset underlying assets a market value there. And then, of course, that the confidence for those discounts uh, possibly to come in. So I'd like to move on now, Emma, and, and look at the, the, the US election, of course, a few weeks ago now and, and see what impact that had on the space. So were there, you know, any particular sectors, any particular trust that saw a greater level of interest since then? You know, was there any changes in the, you know, the macro environment influences on investment trusts as a whole when Donald Trump uh, came into to power? Was there anything notable that you've seen since then? Um, yes, we did see some specific um investment trust uh moves so um the biggest one was um probably the a significant rally in a investment trust called jp morgan emerging europe middle east and africa securities uh, a bit of a mouthful um but that, that fund used to be called jp morgan russian securities so it has a lot of um underlying holdings um in russia that um, uh, not trading due to sanctions and they're being va- valued at um, essentially zero in the NAV. So um, there was some hope that Trump would potentially ease sanctions in Russia and these holdings could see a significant valuation uplift. So um, we saw kind of uh, idiosyncratic um, kind of moves in specific um, trusts like that. Um, other examples is um, Seraphim Space Investment Trust um, saw a rally in the kind of days and weeks following Trump's election, given his uh, commitment to the US Space Force, um, and a- along the same lines, um, with Trump's support of Elon Musk, um, who manages uh, SpaceX, um, a private company that's a, um, a fairly big holding in uh, Bailey Gifford managed funds such as Scottish Mortgage and Shahalian. Um, we saw um, rallies in those funds as well as the kind of uh, confidence in, in some of the underlying holdings. Um, in general, though, uh, I think the outcome of this US election was um, fairly priced in. Um, it wasn't the big shock um, as it was when he won the last time where we saw a lot more market volatility. Um, so there has been uh, less uh, volatility um, in the markets in the kind of days following it. Um, at the underlying level, we ha- um, are hearing when we speak to the managers of investment trust that they are clearly... Um, aware of and and cognizant of the potential impacts um, of Trump wherever they're investing in in whatever asset class there's some potential impacts from his policies but um, the general consensus I think at the moment seems to be that there's actually quite a lot of uncertainty about what he will actually implement Um, and also uh, most managers do generally uh, implement a long-term bottom-up investment strategy Uh, so they um, kind of look through political noise in the short term and invest in just the, the best companies that can withstand um, geopolitical uh, uh, shocks. 
Thank you. So I'd like to try now to take some positivity from the uh, the Labour government and, and the budget. There's not been much around, but there may be some positivity for the investment trust space because there were uh, some changes announced to uh, cost disclosures. It would be great, Emma, if you, if you could outline those, um, first of all, to listeners, as well as explaining whether you feel that they will be beneficial to the space and how they would be beneficial to the space, if you may. Uh, yes, um, of course. So this is something that was announced um, back in September uh, this year. Um, the UK government and FCA uh, announced plans to reform UK retail disclosure rules um, by replacing um, uh, what's called the PRIPS regulation with a, a new framework for um, consumer composite investments. Um, and at the same time, it included um uh, temporary forbearance from the FCA um, with the FCA committing that it won't take um, enforcement action if an investment trust chooses not to follow the requirements of the original legislation. Um, and essentially that the problems with the initial um, or original legislation that um, a lot of the investment trust industry has been lobbying for um, in recent years is that these regulations required and the ongoing costs of investment trust to be aggregated um, and to disclose within um, KID documents um, and and other places, uh, which um, we felt uh, led to a a double counting and an unfair unfair playing field relative to uh, similar products. Um, Essentially, um, obviously, investment trusts do have costs um, of running them, but this is all taken into account within the NAV performance that is disclosed and uh, most importantly, uh, within the share price. Um, An investor will buy an investment trust for the share price and and sell it at the share price. There's no extra costs being taken off your investment at the point of um, buying or selling, um, which these original cost disclosure rules um, did distort um, and we thought were misleading for investors. Um, So there were changes announced um, in September um, that the UK government um, and FCA uh, basically um, said that you didn't have to disclose these ongoing costs anymore. You didn't have to disclose, uh, publish a kid document. Um, uh, and we think this is a um, really positive step. It's removed a key headwind. We have definitely heard anecdotal evidence of um, investors, particularly um, fund of funds and multi-asset investors withdrawing from the investment trust sector purely because of these cost disclosure rules, because it was um, just distorting for their underlying clients. So I do think it's um, a very positive step um, potentially to remove this key headwind. Um, But there are further steps to go. It still needs to go through um, further stages before it gets implemented um, fully. And I think there is still some uncertainty about around how investment trusts can actually apply these rules um, in the fairest way without uh, contradicting other regulations such as consumer duty. Um, and we have seen some uh, platforms, um, kind of Hargreaves Lansdowne um, platforms like that, actually removing um, investment trusts if they are disclosing zero or um, not publishing a kid document. So there's some issues around that. So there are more steps to go. Um, and I don't think uh, all of the um, issues in the investment trust sector in terms of discounts are caused by these cost disclosure rules. But uh, I think if we can reach um, uh, a, a good outcome on the cost disclosure rules, it will remove a key headwind and be a positive um, for the sector. Thank you. So to, to finish off now, um, I'm going to ask a, pre- a pretty broad <laughs> question. I'm sure this is something that uh, that listeners are going to be fascinated to hear your answer on. And, and it is you know, why should UK investors consider or choose investment trusts over funds or ETFs at this point in time? Um, Yes, so in terms of investment trusts over open-ended funds, such as OICs or or USITs, um, I think the closed-ended nature um, of the fund, so the manager having a fixed pool of capital, um, is a really positive aspect of the structure. It enables the managers to take truly long-term decisions and not having to worry about inflows and outflows um, and as well as that they can invest in more illiquid assets um, whether that's just investing further down the market cap spectrum if um, for an equity fund um, 
or enabling them to invest in real assets like property. And we've obviously seen issues with open-ended property funds and them dealing with inflows and outflows and property um, as well as infrastructure or private equity is definitely um, well suited to the um, investment trust structure. Um, Investment trusts can also utilise revenue reserves. Um, So as I mentioned, um, when I talked about the UK equity income sector, um, investment trust committing to deliver consecutive annual years of dividend growth um, that's really helped by the trust structure um, as they can keep back 15% of income they receive in each year in reserve and pay it out in future years um, if the income they receive isn't um, sufficient uh, to cover the dividend in, in any one year. Um, they can also use gearing um, which should en- enhance returns over the long term obviously if um, uh, returns are positive. Um, and particularly on the kind of the ETFs point, a, a lot of ETFs um, still are um, passive, whereas investment trusts are all actively managed, so it can uh, deliver outperformance um, of the index. Um, but even in terms of active ETFs, I think an interesting um, reason to invest in investment trusts at the moment um, is because of the, the discount opportunity, um, which can present um, a very a- attractive um, kind of double whammy um, potential. So if the general environment improves and um, if the underlying NAV performance will improve and we can see discount narrowing. So you get that um, kind of double whammy of underlying improving performance as well as, as discount narrowing. Thank you very much, Emma. That's fascinating. So just a final note to listeners, do check out the notes to this podcast for a link through to the winter flood resource that Emma outlined at the beginning of the podcast. Emma, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone for listening. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed listening to the UK Investor Magazine podcast. Please do share the podcast and we really value any reviews and comments you leave us in your chosen podcast player. The views presented by the hosts and guests of the UK Investor Magazine podcast are in no way investment advice. And please remember, all investment involves risk.